Hello and welcome to Inside Healthcare. According to the Minnesota Department of Health, more than 62,000 people in Minnesota have tested positive for COVID-19. M Health Fairview is now offering free COVID-19 drive-up testing every weekend in August at sites across the Twin Cities. Fairview doctors say they want to reach more people in our communities, especially our diverse populations who might not have access to health care so that they can get tested. Thank you so much, doctor, for joining us and taking time out to be with us. I really appreciate that. So you're conducting these um, community COVID-19 testing and um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the tests that you're currently doing, why you're bringing them out into the community and um, who, should be, who should be showing up for these? Sure, so um, the reason why we're doing these tests is that knowing if you have COVID um, or it, whether or not you're symptomatic is a good way to protect others um, if you do have the virus. There are a lot of barriers to getting these tests, um, even even though we offer them in our clinics. Um, it's it's sometimes hard to get in touch with your doctors to get them ordered and, and to kind of navigate the system. Um, my clinic, I, I work at Roselawn. We work with a, a large um, Karen and uh, Hmong population, and it's not as easy for them to navigate the system. There's a lot of barriers and reaching out to the community is a way to break down one of those barriers. We've heard about a number of different tests. What are the tests that you're actually giving people that show up for your community drives, drive up, drive through um, testing? Sure, so um, the, the, the tests that we're doing are the mid turbinate test. So it's not the one that goes all the way to the back of your throat. Um, it actually goes 10 seconds on each side and will make you want to sneeze, but it shouldn't cause any pain. Um, it isn't, it's a test that would determine if you have COVID at the time of the test and not if you had COVID in the past. And it's a very quick test and, and that, and, and you're saying somewhat painless. And Somewhat painless, uncomfortable, um, just having something in your nose, but um, should not be painful. Um, I've seen a lot of people sneeze, but that's probably the worst of it. I understand that you had um, your first weekend and you had a number over a thousand people that were tested. I think we had over 1,100 people come out to get tested. Um, a majority of them were pre-registered, which is great. Um, it was a relatively seamless process as far as what I saw. And you're doing these um, in the community through the end of the month on the weekends at, at various locations or a couple of different locations? Yes, so right now on Saturdays, we're at Aldridge Arena in Maplewood. And on Sundays, we're at uh, Washington Technology uh, Magnet School in St. Paul from 2 to 6 p.m. And are you testing all ages? Are you doing children as well? We're testing all ages, so I saw anyone, but I think I personally saw people between the ages of two months, um, and I think the oldest was maybe in their 90s. So literally everybody with or without symptoms, no insurance is required. All we need is a way to um, be able to contact you with the results. I bet it's got to be satisfying for you to be able to reach out into the community and, you know, get people to get tested that need to be tested in that. Yeah, as doctors, I know we, we have a limited amount of time, but we are always looking for ways to reach out um, and help our communities, even if it's outside of work. So, um, yeah, I get a lot of um, personal satisfaction in being able to directly interact with the community. So final comments that you would give for our viewers on if they're interested in this testing, what do they go, how do they go about doing that and who should, um, um, who should be showing up for? Yeah, it, and actually literally anybody who is interested in getting tested with or without, without symptoms. Um, if you are interested, I would check with um, the Ramsey County um, and Minnesota Department of Health for more information on how to pre-register and um, to see where our sites are. For more information, they can go to your website at M Health Fairview then as well. Mm -hmm. Well, doctor, thank you. It's a pleasure to have you with us and great information. So thank you. Thank you very much. And as we first told you last month, doctors with the urgency room are continuing to provide COVID-19 rapid test at its Woodbury Urgency Room Clinic. For more information about these tests or to schedule an appointment, go to their website at urgencyroom.com. 
And just as schools are reopening, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Children's Hospital Association report that more than 97,000 children in the U.S. have tested positive for the virus itself in the last two weeks of July. And health experts say anxiety has been running high among kids and parents everywhere due to the virus, even before schools were reopening. The Youth Service Bureau has created Partner in Parenting video podcast aimed at helping students and parents cope. Hi, my name is Chris Ayersman, and I'm the Director for Infectious Disease at the Minnesota Department of Health. I know that COVID-19 is on everyone's minds. Slowing the spread of COVID-19 is vital for protecting our communities. Right now, it is important for people to cancel large gatherings and practice social distancing. And what this means is making sure that you're maintaining a distance of about six feet between people. Continue washing your hands, covering your cough, and cleaning frequently touched surfaces. Stay home when you're sick. I'll say that again, stay home when you're sick. That is the most important thing. We know these recommendations mean disruption to your lives, but they are so important. We need to slow the spread of the virus so that we don't overwhelm our hospitals and clinics. Thank you for doing your part. If we work together, we can manage this situation. Last August, White Bear Lake Police Captain Dale Hager was at the office when he suddenly suffered a stroke. Mary Klein reports on how he's doing today. It was just surreal. It was such a surreal moment that um, that I that I went through, and um, I suppose there's a little bit of really on that guy. Like I had a stroke, you know. As soon as I got up, I fell right under the desk right here, and that's when I looking at my arm and my leg in the same field of vision and thinking I can't move these right now. So I'm having a stroke. And so I knew I was having a stroke at that moment. And the chief walks in the door, and, she, <laughs> and I won't use the expletive that she used, but she walked in the door, she goes, what, what are you doing, right? And I looked at her and I went, rawr, 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 rawr. And she went, you're having a stroke. And I said, yeah. I owe, at the very least, I owe the quality of life I have now to Regents Hospital, to health partners, to Dr. Sane. Oh, hey. I really enjoy what I do. Uh, I'm a stroke neurologist. We always quote a study that uh, estimated that for every one minute, the stroke treatment is delayed. About 10 million neurons, 10 million brain cells die. Uh, so, we are uh, fighting the time. Dale was uh, fortunate and that he called for help right away. And of course, he was brought to the hospital right away and he came in the perfect time. We want to see patients as early as possible and he came early and that helped him. My kids are probably um, irritated with me because I hug them way more now than I have ever hugged them before. There by the grace of God go I, right? I mean, any day could be your last day, and so um, I guess I feel I guess I feel that way. Vision loss is not something that you feel until it happens. Most people lose their vision from diseases like macular degeneration and glaucoma, not at birth. With macular degeneration you lose your central vision. You have a blind spot right in the center of your face, so I can't actually see your face. So even that little circle in which I could see became a big blur. I was 65 when I first was diagnosed with glaucoma. There were no symptoms. I had no headaches. Three million Americans have glaucoma, and half 
don't even know it. 11 million people in the United States have macular degeneration. You lose mobility, independence, changes your entire life. So many eye disorders can be treated if caught early. My husband tells me that I have beautiful brown eyes, and I don't want to lose that. Make a plan today to get your eyes checked. Visit brightfocus.org to learn more. Joining us now with safe social distancing here at the SEC TV studios is Linda Barnhart, and she's a retired nurse. And you have an amazing story to tell us about some of the things you've been doing for the last couple of months here, four or five months, and how you brought together strangers and how that you've been able to make thousands of masks, um, scrub caps and also headbands and stuff mm -hmm. and you're getting those to the front lines of the pandemic and amazing so I was glad to have you come on the show so thank you for being with us. Yeah thanks Jody. yeah it's been a really fun um, gathering that I've had with pulling people together and it it started in April I was in Florida and came back from Florida and there was this great need that I could see around um, making masks and I knew I was, um, I'm on the board of directors for Nexus Family Healing, and it's a mental health residential treatment program, and they have a lot of foster families. And I thought about this as a nurse, I thought they may need some masks because I knew PPE was not available. Right. And so as a result, I contacted them and I said, I can probably make some masks for you if you need to. That's how it all started. So I made 50 masks for them. They picked those up from my house and got those out to their fa foster families. Well, With then no I, contact, right? You just right. had them on the doorstep? I just put them out on my doorstep and they would come and get them. And then as a result, it came that my daughter-in-law's sister works for Dakota County and she's just down the street and she was telling me how they had such a need for their foster families. And as a result from that, she was pulling fabric in and elastic in on drives and I was getting those, she'd drop them off on my doorstep and I would make masks. So I couldn't keep up with it. So I put a request out on Nextdoor in Woodbury and I said, I need sewists to help me. And donations, we were running out of elastic. And as a result, I got probably up to 65 volunteers. Incredible. And probably about, I think it's People about 12 so us. Before this no, and... a couple of them I knew, but um, it was mainly people that just wanted to help in some fashion. Mm -hmm. And just like me as a past nurse, I wanted to give back in some fashion too, that I knew there was a need. There was a real shortage of PPE. We didn't want to take the PPE that's needed for the hospitals at the front line. And so how could we help? And that's how we started that out. And it grew from there. Um, you yes. said that it went to some of the other places? And yes, so it's gone to Nexus Family Healing, as I talked about, and that's in four states, but most of it came here in Minnesota. Pride Institute out on the west side of um, the Twin Cities. It's gone Washington County, Dakota County, um, Health Partners Hospice, Those there's been nurses that have Incredible. contacted me directly there, M Health, most of the hospitals on the east side with M Health. Yeah, you and bought, Children's you United. You some examples, too, of yeah. what you were doing. So. Yeah, so here are scrub caps that I've made, and we've made probably 65, 70, 75 scrub caps. A lot of these have gone to nurses um, that they use themselves and, wa and wash themselves. Um, United, Mother Baby, um, Hospice, um, they want to make sure that they cover their heads really good. So that, this is made by Anderson Corporation. They partnered with me to make 1,500 of these specifically. And they would make them, they got the fabric from Affinity here in White Bear Lake um, for quilting. And they put these together and um, just took their, their um, corporation, one of their plants, and did this for a while. And I distributed 1,500 of these for them. And then these are just wow. the little masks, the little girls masks that we had made or little kids masks. Some of these have gone to Children's Hospital. And um, this is the basic mask that we make um, for, for that we give out. And what I had done was I put kits together and I'd have one piece of fabric of one kind and another piece and then four pieces of, of six inch elastic. And I'd put these in kits of 50, put them in bags on my step and individuals would wow. come and pick them up and they'd sew them. They'd bring them back and drop them off and then I would distribute them. 
Oh my gosh, that is yeah. incredible. And you said that you've um, distributed over 5,500 of these yes. various things? And well, 5,500 masks. I mm -hmm. think we've done 70, 75 or so scrub caps. Um, we have distributed, I think there's also a headband that we have here that we put the little buttons on and we just hand sew these on. And these are for nurses also that it prevents them from having their ears break down. And actually I have nurses from my specific clinic that are um, texting me just to get these personally. And we just make those for them yet. And, and so probably probably done probably about 50 to 100 of those too. Incredible. Yeah. That's just amazing. And you're kind of coming to a, a close now, you were saying. That yes, we you... are. Um, everybody was very, very active with this. I probably had about six SOAS that were extremely active. And as people are starting to go back to work, kids are going to school. We had some kids that even helped us cut um, and, and grandchildren. And so it's a really sweet kind of thing that was going on with it. And they, um, as they're going back to school and going back to work, it seems like it's kind of slowing down. And also what I found is that um, the elastic that we make homemade, these worked really good when we first did this at, at um, in March and April because um, there was such a need and they weren't available. And now the industrial masks are out and people can get those and buy them at the different stores and that. And I think they last a little bit longer. This elastic doesn't la last as long. And so we're kind of slowing down with that. I am still um, have some that would do it if we wanted to, but we'll, we'll kind of see how it goes. But we are slowing down. What an incredible yeah. project. And that Thanks, you Jody. gave of your time and, and yeah. probably saved some lives and protect our yeah. healthcare workers and stuff. Well, we're just really happy that we were able to help because what one of the rules that we had with it was that it had to go to nonprofits. It wasn't that somebody could buy a bunch of masks from us. It, this is for nonprofits that really needed it at the time. Foster families, mental health, residents, those kinds of things that really needed this help. And there was a great need. There continues to be a great need need for this, but then it was, it, it felt very good. Just thank amazing, you. just amazing. I just can't say enough about it. And yeah. thank you for doing this, and thank you yeah. to all of your volunteer, army of volunteers, sewers, yeah. and, and thank you to them as well. So Yeah, thank you, Jody. Pleasure. Appreciate being here today. Pleasure to have you on our show. Thanks, thank Linda. You. Yep, you're welcome. And finally, during COVID-19, Minnesota State Parks are seeing record numbers of visitors this summer. We close out by revisiting our conversation with a park ranger at the Afton State Park about ways for you and your family to stay safe while enjoying our parks. During the fall, lots of folks still head to the Minnesota State Parks, so we've come to Afton State Park and to talk to a park ranger about um, safety tips that can help keep you and your family safe, and we're pleased to have with us Park Ranger Nick Barrows. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. It's really great. Thanks yeah, for thanks taking for time out. out. Absolutely. It's a gorgeous day right it today. It is. It does get much better than that, especially this time of year. So tell us a little bit about Afton State Park. Yeah, so the park is uh, about 1,700 acres. Um, we've got 22 miles of hiking trails in the park. We're a very popular hiking and trail running destination. Um, this big summertime draw is going to be our swimming beach. We have a sand, beautiful sand beach right on the edge of the St. Croix River. Um, we have camping in the park. There's 28 hike-in backpack sites, so a really rustic experience. And there's also group camps, camper cabins, and yurts for people to take advantage of as well. And you were telling me that the fall, it really comes alive here. It with does. With the colors our, in, the, in the trees yeah, absolutely. and everything. Busiest time of year. Um, you know, the, the fall colors up and down the valley are really something to, it's worth making the trip to see. So. And even in the wintertime, too, this is a hot spot. It is, yep. We do uh, cross-country skiing and snowshoeing in the winter. Um, it really offers a whole different perspective than what you see. You know, it really changes from season the season incredibly but seeing it from the summer to the winter is really a treat. So. so everyone they want to come out here have a good time but what would be some of those top 10 safety tips that you would give them so that they can have a great time when they're sure. here? Sure so the first one that's really at the top of our mind is going to be protection from uh, tick-borne illnesses so um, being sure you're using your mosquito spray or clothing treatments keep the ticks off there's uh, wood ticks are typically act a little bit more active earlier in the summer and the spring but deer, tuck, uh, deer ticks have been active year-round there have been reported cases of bites even in December on those years that there's low snow. So, wow, that's hard to believe. Yep, yeah. yep. So Good with, to uh, keep in mind. Absolutely. With Lyme disease, and there's a few new viruses that are just starting, they're getting documented reports of that are pretty risky. So, so yeah, you don't want to take that home with you once you leave the park yep, as well. So absolutely. make sure you check yourself 
after you left, leave the yep, park. Yep, thorough check and light colored clothing so they're easy to spot, tick gators, the spray, you know, it all, it's, uh, it all helps to keep yourself clear. So. What about like wildlife or even vegetation? Are there things that people should be concerned about? Sure, yeah, there's always, you know, um, not really any threatening animals in the area here. We have occasional it's bear a friendly reports. Park. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> especially, um, you know, going off trail, there's poison ivy and different things like that. So being sure you're able to identify things when you're on the trail and if you have, you know, if you're unsure about it, just it's best to avoid it. So. And what about snakes or anything like that? Snakes in our area, there aren't any venomous, dangerous snakes. Um, so, but it's still good to keep an eye out. We do have fox snakes in the park that actually mimic rattlesnakes, so it gives makes people a little nervous. But uh, they're, you know, all kind of all bark and no bite type of thing. So. So I think the same advice if with all the hiking trails to make sure that people have good. Yep. walking shoes and make sure that they're covered and things like that. Yep, sturdy footwear, staying hydrated. You know, it's been a cooler summer, so it hasn't been as much of a risk, but especially as we go into these cooler seasons, you don't notice that you're becoming dehydrated because it's cooler out, you're not uncomfortable, but that uh, dry air is just sapping the moisture from you. So bringing a water bottle of water with you is very important. Yeah, we talked with one of the urgent um, room physicians, and he was saying that that is a concern of dehydration. People, they're around the water, around our lakes, our rivers, and, and they, they get dehydrated. Absolutely. Because they're just not drinking yep. enough fluids, yep. or they're drinking too much alcohol too. Yeah. <laughs> that could be another. <laughs> Shouldn't be an issue in state parks. We, yeah. you know, keep it family friendly. But yeah, it's just something else that you're, when you're outside, uh, be sure you're aware of. What would be some of those common? Um, rules and policies that everyone should know before they come to the park. Too. Yeah, you know, the most important thing is let people know where you're going. Um, you know, have a check-in, check-out system if you're hiking alone especially. And why so is they, that? Well, so they know when to expect you. If something happens, if you roll an ankle or you get uh, turned around, they'll know that, okay, well, this person said they were going to be home at this time. They're not here yet. I need to call and, you know, send out, uh, send help for them because you mm -hmm. never know what happens. So. Yeah, sounds like great advice. Um, also, what should they bring with them to the park? I mean, what kinds of things would you advise them to have? You mentioned yeah. um, having water. Yep, bottle of water. Usually a, a basic first aid kit is nice to carry with. They make ones that are extremely compact. You can even throw it in your pocket. You got basic band-aids and things like that. Um, uh, sturdy footwear is also very important, especially at some of our trails here. They can mm -hmm. get rough, so be sure you have good footwear. Um, comfortable uh, layered clothing is important especially as we get into the fall season so that you can you know stay warm or cool off as mm -hmm. needed because when you're sweating that's when you're really at risk for for dehydrating so and then um do cell phones work very well here or should you have a also uh, obviously there's not too many places to charge it in. Yeah, so. yeah, a charge cell phone, you know, close to the metro, most parks are gonna have decent cell coverage, but it really can be spotty. So again, if you're out of contact with the phones, it's good to have that check-in, check-out system with someone that knows where you are, no one to expect you back. Any other um, safety things that someone could bring with them you think that would be good? Maybe you said extra clothing that you can maybe blankets or things like that? Yeah, or? you know, it's, it's one of those things that it's best to kind of prepare for the worst. You know, you don't expect something to go bad, but if it does, you know, survival kits, especially in the winter, is very important. Uh, you know, food stores, things like that is, you know, good to bring with. It's not essential, but if you want to be prepared for the worst, it's, it's best to, you know, have the things with you so you can respond accordingly. And also, um, any concerns about weapons or anyone? I mean, obviously no firearms. Yeah, but firearms aren't allowed in state parks. Um, you know, you a lot those. of people bring, you wouldn't need it. I mean, um, you know, it, it's they're, they're allowed to carry with you, especially the pocket knives and okay. things like that. Something considered a weapon aren't allowed in state parks. So there's not that threat. Um, but beyond that, you know. You know, in out west, we've heard a lot of um, different fires happening at a lot of the national parks and stuff and um, any concern about fires here and and our, just at just at the picnic areas they have to yeah campfire safety you know if you're just doing your general campfires um, you know it's especially with younger kids it's good a good idea to keep it close as, as close an eye as possible on them um, our fire rings are all to the fire codes that they've got a higher rim so there's not as much of a risk I, I can of, tell that, yeah, yeah see that yep yep so, but yeah, campfire safety, it, it just takes a moment for something to go wrong, so. Yeah, we want to keep the parks looking as beautiful yeah, as they are. Yep, and we do a pretty aggressive, you know, prescribed burning program in the parks. So the wildfire risk isn't as significant, especially a year like this where we've had timely rains. But yeah, especially as we get into the fall season where it's drier, make sure that fires are completely extinguished and you have water close by, just to make sure nothing escapes for, to where it's not supposed to be. Yeah, you, you'd hate to start a fire. Yeah, right? yeah. Or, get burnt by a fire as well. So just final advice for our viewers. It's good to bring, um, you know, a survival whistle with, uh, you know, something that if your voice isn't able to carry to get a hold of someone, if you're in trouble, um, those whistles can, you know, be heard from up to 
you know, two miles away in the right types of conditions. So it's going to make you that much more um, likely to be found if you are lost or injured or something like that. It's also good to bring a, a flashlight with, um, you know, because you never know if you do get turned around somewhere if you're going to be out beyond, be, uh, you know, later than sunset, especially as the days are getting shorter as we get into the fall season here. And I think you'd want to also be aware of. Um the weather, what kind of weather conditions could yep. develop maybe once you're here even? Absolutely, yep. In the summer, there's always a thunderstorm risk. They can really come up out of nowhere. In the winter, you know, conditions change rapidly, especially as we get into the fall. You know, you can start out your day and it's, you know, 75 degrees and sunny at noon and by five o'clock it can be 34 and sleet coming down. So, so. be really aware of that. Yep. And uh, as um, park rangers, you're also aware of who's in the park as well. We they are. all have to check in before yep. they yep. come in. Yep. As, uh, as state park staff, we're always, you know, addressing any safety issues. We're quick to respond if something gets reported to the office. So if you get into a situation where you're not comfortable, feel that your safety is going to be at, at risk, um, call the park office and we'll we'll um, get out to help take care of it between us and the sheriff's office we've got responders available and if someone wants to get more information about the park or about park safety and stuff like that where should they go what would you recommend yep the dnr uh, website is a, a great resource just go to mndnr.gov and there's a state parks page otherwise uh, you can call us here at the park at uh, 651-436-5391 and we'll be happy to answer any questions people may have Final comments for our viewers, a recommendation or advice? Sure, I'd say, uh, you know, if you are looking for something to do this fall, it's definitely worth making the trip out to the park here. It's uh, absolutely gorgeous up and down the river valley. We've got some great overlooks, and it's a great place to take in the fall colors. So we hope to see you out, and hope everyone stays safe. Sounds so, great. All right. Nick Barrels, park ranger, yep. thank you for being with us. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.